Uh, good afternoon to all of you to the Tibet Museum's monthly Tibet Awareness Talk series. And uh, I'm very honored to have with us today the guest speaker, Dr. John Winston Blazer. And Dr. John will uh, speak on the Tibetan civilization. And uh, before I really hand over the session to the Dr. John, so I would like to do a short introduction about the uh, today's guest speaker. So. Uh, the Dr. John Winston Beleza is an archaeologist and cultural historian focused on the pre-Buddhist heritage of Tibet and the Western uh, Himalaya. So he obtained his PhD in anthropology from the University of Kent. And Dr. Beleza has been exploring and researching in Tibet since 1984. Uh, he has comprehensively charted the monuments and rocks uh, a rock art of the ancient Shangshung proto-state, revealing the surprising level of cultural sophistication attained on the uppermost uh, reaches of the Tibetan Plateau more than 2,000 years ago. Uh, so Blazer has also worked uh, extensively on old Tibetan mytho ritual text, making the first translation of a uh, number of uh, Tuhang and Gathang Bump manuscript. Uh, in addition to numerous scholarly and popular articles, uh, the Dr. John has published uh, 14 books with the major academic presses. So with this, uh, I've done the short intro about the today's guest speaker. Now I would like to request uh, uh, Dr. John to kindly commence the today's session and thank you so much. My name is John Vincent Baletza and I'm going to give a presentation today on the six major centers of Tibetan civilization. I want to very much thank the Tibet Museum for allowing me to deliver this lecture uh, to you today. So we're going to talk about the origins of civilization on the Tibetan Plateau. The Tibetan Plateau, I think most of you that are listening to this talk uh, will be familiar with its uh, geographic uh, nature. Uh, the, the plateau is ringed by high mountains on all sides. On, uh, to the south, there's the uh, Himalaya. To the north is the Kunlun Range. And to the west are the Karakoram and Pamirs. And to the east are a number of meridian ranges between the great rivers, uh, the Yangtze, Salween, and Mekong. Uh, I think a good way to begin this talk is to address a question that many people ask me. How old are the Tibetans? How long have Tibetans been in their homeland on the Tibetan Plateau? Recent archaeogenetic studies carried out by the Chinese and international groups of researchers indicate that the Tibetan gene pool can be characterized as follows. The genetic origins of the Tibetans are considerably more ancient and complex than previously thought, and have been pushed back to at least 40,000 years ago. So the Tibetan genes, the Tibetan ancestry includes both Old Stone Age and New Stone Age ancestral lineages. Uh, the Tibetan genome, paternal and maternal, both the mother's and the father's side, uh, have uh, 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 delineate various, uh, deline are, are unbroken for thousands of years. This is a very important point. The people that are, the Tibetans as they are now, uh, share some of their ancestry going back 40,000 years. And even, uh, and with a continuous legacy, an uninterrupted uh, occupation on the plateau. The ancient pla uh, populations of the plateau and Himalayan Rimland were closely related genetically to Northeast Asians who inhabited the upper Yellow River, the Machu, Inner Mongolia and the Amur Valley circa 9,500 to 4,000 years ago. Uh, th particularly the early part of this connection with the North, with Northeast Asia is long before the uh, formation of the Chinese nation uh, as we think of it today. Uh, 
So as the Sino-Tibetan language group, we can also see, if you will, a Sino-Tibetan genetic family. But the, the split between Tibetans and Chinese took place many thousands of years ago. The contemporary populations of the Tibetan Plateau and Himalayan Rimland, Tibetan, Kyung, Sherpa, uh, share very strong genetic links to individuals who lived on the plateau 5,000 years ago. So here we're talking mostly about the New Stone Age lineages. But it's an unbroken chain of people and ancestry going back 5,000 years. The G Tibetan genome as it is today is very similar to how it was 5,000 years ago. And this has been confirmed by a study just completed this year in 2023. Uh, so to, um, to um, conclude, the Tibetans are an ancient people that have inhabited the plateau in one form or another for tens of thousands of years. And for the last 5,000 years, their genome, their ancestry, genetic ancestry, has been, uh, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, the same as it is today. I think we need to look at what is a civilization, because in Tibetan there really is no word for civilization. People may use words like uh, palyun, the glories of uh, in human endeavor, um, uh, rigne, all of the forms of knowledge and industries, writing, uh, even sometimes uh, for, uh, civilization as a shorthand, Tibetans will say shedik, all the advanced forms of knowledge. So there really is no word for, uh, uh, no term specifically for the um, English uh, Latin term civilization. Uh, so a civilization, according to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, and according to really all, all sources, uh, would say a relatively high level of cultural and technological development. So we're talking about advanced cultures here when we, uh, when we, when we speak of civilization. And the main criteria for civilization are the following, the development of a system of writing, urban settlement, hierarchical social structure, centralized political control, sophisticated network of monuments, advanced technological capabilities, multilinguistic and multi-ethnic composition. Now, as regards Tibet before the seventh century in the development of Tibetan writing, there is no evidence that the Tibetans had a native uh, system of writing. Uh, the Yungjungbun uh, texts claim that there was a system of writing in Shangsheng long before the time of Songsteng Gampo and the minister Tomi Sambota in the seventh century. However, there is no epigraphic archeolog or archeological evidence uh, to support that claim of their being writing before the seventh century. Moreover, the scripts proffered as belonging to Shangsheng by the Yungrungbong texts are surprisingly similar to Lanza and Vartu, two ornamental scripts that developed after the 11th century. Urban settlement, there is no evidence that Tibet had cities in the sense of large communities with thousands of people packed closely together with, uh, that, that we do not have evidence for. Even Lhasa, I mean, in, in the Lhasa Valley, Omatang, and there was this Omatso, the Milk Lake was supposed to be where the Jokang, uh, Suglakang sits now. Uh, the only possibility, and this requires more evidence, is perhaps in the far northeast, the what was known, now known as Amdo, um, in and around uh, the Tibetan areas of Repkung and Trika, uh, regions that were known as Asha in early times. They may possibly have had urban settlement, and this needs to be examined further. Hierarchical social structure, clearly there was a hierarchical uh, you know, structure. You had uh, rulers, ministers, um, priests, commoners, uh, military people and the, the evidence, textual rock art evidence, archaeological evidence, clearly shows that there was a pecking order in ancient Tibet. So Tibet had this also, uh, this uh, aspect of civilization. Centralized political control, 
it would seem because of the size of the monuments in places like central Tibet and Dengari, uh, Changtang, Upper Tibet, that there was a centralized polity. This polity um, commanded very large monuments and it's also buttressed by textual references to kings uh, ruling over places like Shangshung and of course central Tibet Pugilpe uh, before the seventh century. Advanced technological capabilities, this is coming to light really just in the last 20 years or so for the most part. Tibet had advanced uh, industrial uh, technologies um, and capabilities. Uh, they were able to work with bronze, iron, copper, brass, gold, silver. In addition, they crafted things out of wood, leather, cane, glass, stone, uh, ceramics, of course. And these materials were used in advanced fashion that were, you would say, concomitant with the development of uh, material, uh, object, material culture in other parts of, uh, of Asia at that time, before the seventh century. So yes, Tibet had advanced technological capabilities, apparently all over the uh, plateau, but the area that's been most closely studied is Western Tibet, particularly the region of Guge. We'll speak more about that later. Uh, Multilinguistic and multi-ethnic composition, most civilizations, and that would include Tibet, are not just a s single tribe or even just a single language. If we look at the Tibetan Plateau, which is approximately 2,000, uh, excuse me, 2,400,000 square kilometers. It's a huge area from Ladakh to uh, Damsedo in the far east. I mean, this is, an, this is over 2,500 kilometers or so. There are numerous groups, and there's still numerous tribes and language groups in Tibet. The Tibetan Plateau is home to more than 30, perhaps 40 different languages. And I'm not speaking about the dialects. There are dozens and dozens of dialects. But there are many, dozens, uh, 30 to 40 distinctive languages on the plateau. In the Far East, in uh, the reason uh, uh, Tibetans call Gyamorong, um, there are no less than seven or eight languages. Uh, there is an interesting, a very rare language in Kongbo, in Pusumso. Uh, there in the north uh, east and in the far um, southeast of the Tibetan Plateau, there are other groups uh, speaking other languages that uh, are uh, a part of uh, the Tibetan, of Tibetan civilization in that they share many of the cultural and religious qualities of their kinfolk all over the plateau. So a synopsis here, I think. We'll, uh, this is a good place to give us a, give a synopsis as we begin. It is often thought that civilization on the plateau began in the Yarlung Valley with the coming of its first king, Nayatri Sempo. Although the Yarlung, Sempo, uh, Yarlung dynasty was instrumental in the cultural development and political consolidation of central Tibet, Civilization took root in other parts of the plateau as well. On the vast uplands of the Changtang and De, Upper Tibet, what I call Upper Tibet, the highest and driest portion of Tibet, an advanced cultural order known traditionally as Shangsheng appeared even before the Yarlung Songbo, uh, the Yarlung dynasty, and before the civilization sprung up in the uh, Yarlung Songbo uh, river valley. And we have textual and archaeological evidence to support uh, this assertion that civilization in Shangsheng, uh, in Western Tibet, uh, predated, or well, we maybe it should be safer to say most likely uh, predated that in the uh, Yarlung Valley. Uh, a sophisticated early cultures also arose in other parts of Tibet, including Ladakh, Sumpa, Asha, Gyamorom, uh, and these form the foundations of Tibetan civilization um, pre-7th century we're talking about here. These are the, if you will, components of Tibetan civilization. Beginning around 600 CE, King Namri Longsen, Namri Longsen, his son Songsen Gampo, and their royal successors brought the disparate peoples and polities of the plateau under 
unified rule to create the Tibetan Empire. This formative event helped forge an integral, plateau-wide civilization that has persisted to the present day. Now, I remember giving a talk uh, here, I, I was very close to here, uh, it was a Tibetan lectures in 2009, there was a conference. And uh, when I spoke about these early groups, which are mentioned in Tibetan text, uh, what are often referred to, at least in English, as proto-states, uh, there was a there was some f some feedback that there was concerning that this meant that then there were different Tibets, that there were many Tibets, that there isn't one Tibetan people or one Tibetan nation or civilization, but th this is not the case because around 600 after 600, beginning with Namli Sosten, the plateau was united politically, and this then was the impetus for the amalgamation of Tibetic peoples all over the plateau uh, to form, if you will, a singular culture or superculture. Uh, and, and from the 7th century, 8th, 9th century onwards, that this culture became largely synonymous with Buddhism and uh, an alternative uh, uh, religion uh, known as, uh, later known as Yong Jung Bun. Uh, so the language, Tibetan language, Tibetan religion, and many cultural traditions, uh, probably the bulk of them, stem from this period, uh, you know, from around the 7th century in that imperial period, 7th to 9th century. And this, you know, the unification of the plateau politically also meant the unification of the plateau, uh, eventually at least, uh, culturally and linguistically. However, as in many places in complex civilizations, that even includes China, China before the time of the Han Dynasty, composed many different peoples. Uh, for instance, in the, in the um, uh, Sichuan Basin, there was the Shu, Shu Kingdom, the Shu Kingdom, and that was not uh, Han, they were not Han peoples. Uh, the southern part of China before the uh, Han period, or even, even during the Han period, and even after, after until really the Wei Dynasty was composed of many different, uh, different groups of peoples, cultures, languages. So even China is composed of various uh, proto-states, if you will, proto-cultures. Uh, let's take another example, F France. Uh, France, now is a, people take pride, French take pride in being French, but French are, uh, originally they were Celts, they were Germanic, they were Latins, they were uh, Gauls, they were uh, uh, perhaps Aboriginal groups spreading in uh, from Iberia. So the French nation is made composed of many different um, peoples. And so and, you know, France is just and France is just one country in Western um, civilization. You you can say the same about Italy or Spain. In earlier times, they were composed of many different peoples. I mean. Until the conquest, for instance, until the uh, uh, conquest of the Italian peninsula by the Romans, uh, there were many different Italic and non-Italic groups, be, uh, you know, in, in uh, including the Etruscans, on the uh, on the plateau. But now, of course, the Tibetans, uh, I'm sorry, on the in, in the uh, Italian peninsula. But now, of course, the Italians see themselves, you know, for all intents and purposes, as a singular people. So that because that. The roots of Tibetan civilization are culturally, linguistically uh, diverse. Does not mean that Tibetan doesn't have an identity as a, as as a, as a civilization. It does. It just means that its foundations are rich and varied. So um, I guess I'll uh, permit people to read this in Tibetan, if you will. But I uh, this is basically the points I went over in Tibetan. I'll just keep it up for a couple moments. And this is uh, the same thing I was just speaking about, basically, um, uh, in, in, uh, translated in Tibetan by um, Changchup uh, Ozer, uh, whom I thank for his uh, good work. All right, so let's look at these proto-states, uh, cultural provinces of Tibet, pre-7th century. So there were seven or eight major ones, or so it seems. The borders here in red are very approximate, except perhaps for 
Shangshung, I cannot vouch for these borders. This is a rough estimate of the cultural borders, provinces of Tibet before 600 CE. So it's an approximation. This is important. One, of course, is Ladakh. Two, Shangshung. Three, uh, Pugyalpu, which of course is uh, central Tibet, and and Mun regions uh, in three further to the south, uh, perhaps. And the Mun may have not had a proto-state, but to this day in southern Tibet, all uh, across southern Tibet, it, uh, even in southwestern Tibet, there are groups known as Mun, uh, tribal groups, and uh, they have uh, distinctive dialects and uh, linguistic affiliations, uh, particularly in. Um, uh, Bhutan and Arunachal Pradesh to this very day. Okay, so let's continue. Four, Sumpa. Five, Asha and Minyak. And this Minyak here, as I'm envision it, envisioning it, is a, a Minyak of uh, older or earlier textual sources. Um, Minyak nowadays is often thought of the region in Kham, of Eastern Kham between um, uh, Dharmsedo and um, Tao, uh, but this apparently is not the Minyak mentioned in early sources, but this is a question that I'm sure that there are scholars and people that study these kind of things will know more about this than uh, I'm able to present here. And then seven Gyamorong, that little slice of uh, very uh, deep valleys and mountains on the far east of Tibet. All of these regions uh, the predominant religion is Tibetan Buddhism with the inclusion of Yungjung burned to this very day. However, there are still minority religions, particularly in southern and eastern Tibet, uh, often groups of uh, priests. Uh, they're informal religious traditions, uh, ritual traditions, uh, with non-Buddhist priests such as the Jo and the Aya and uh, uh, Pacho and other other. Uh, uh, um, the uh, Labun, etc., who practice, if you will, earlier or alternative religious customs to this very day. Now, Ladakh, actually, Ladakh in er, old Tibetan sources, sources written between the 7th, 8th to 10th century, Ladakh, the few references to it, such as in the old Tibetan annals, uh, Ladakh, or at least part of it, was known as Maryul, Shangshung, Pulgyapu, uh, Mun, and Sumpa, Asha, and Jang are mentioned also in old Tibetan sources. So these are very old names, ethnonyms, for these early cultures and uh, proto-states in some cases. Uh, however, Gyamorong and Minyak as far to my knowledge, and looking at the searchable databases, old Tibetan databases, are not mentioned in old Tibetan documents. Now, I'm not certain what Gyamorong was called in early times, nor what um, Minyak was called in early times, if they had other names. Uh, however, this information may be uh, out there in, uh, you know, and had been, had been presented by, possibly by Tibetan uh, scholars. For instance, uh, Gyamorong, there's a I think it's 12, 13 volumes, a tremendous uh, series of books, uh, authoritative books on Gyamorong written by the great scholar Senla, who is now almost 100 years old, who I had the, uh, uh, the pleasure of meeting, uh, you know, privilege of meeting in, um, a few years back. All right, so... We see these various er areas, and now I just want to give you examples of early monuments in these various regions. So we have here Ladakh Tokmunkar, uh, maybe uh, uh, active between the 5th and 9th, 10th centuries. Shangshung Yulkambu, dating to the 1st millennium BC. This is a very large necropolis with thousands of standing stones and huge uh, temple tombs uh, uh, appended to these concourses of Doring or To. Uh, very impressive monuments. And uh, nothing at all to do with later Buddhist traditions coming from India, etc. These are distinctive um, 
monuments found on the plateau in early times. Uh, Pugel, uh, Pugel Peu, uh, central Tibet, of course, and I illustrate here from the 7th century, the Bangso, the burial mound of Songsen Kampo. And here also uh, below Sumpa, the Dragutara, a hilltop installation uh, on the shores of Namso. And that is if Sumpa extended as far west as Namso. It appears that it does, but this is uh, room, uh, there's room for far more research in this area. And for Asha, I show a early a fortress rampart in Trika, one of the three valleys of Trika. There are a number of these early fortresses believed to be a contemporaneous, at least in some, uh, in, in some uh, accounts, with uh, the Han Dynasty. No, they are not Chinese. They belonged to at least what became known uh, by the 7th century as Asha in the northeastern and a part of Amdo. Um, so these are, again, distinctive monuments, very different from Asha monuments, are very different from Shangsheng, which are very different from central Tibet. So you had distinctive archaeological monuments. We'll look at a little bit more at that in, in, a, in a few moments. And then for Gyamorong, I wanted to present Kalinkakar, which is believed to date to very early times. And we're looking at a very large uh, stones and a foundation wall, Cyclopean uh, masonry here. And this is supposed to date to early times, perhaps around the beginning of the Common Era. Now, how do you study Tibetan, ancient Tibet? Well, I think we need to look at that at least briefly. So textual sources for a history of Tibet. There are a number of sources, uh, types of sources there. Actually, probably if you compiled everything that has a historical ref reference or historical complexion in any, any way at all, there would be literally thousands of texts that could be harnessed for the study of history and even prehistory in Tibet. So some of the major groups are like the uh, Dungwan Old Tibetan Manuscripts, uh, manus Dungwan Manuscripts in other languages, and then you have other types of Old Tibetan Manuscripts, uh, rit ritual text, military text, and then the wooden slips in East Turkestan, etc. And then classical Tibetan texts. You have, of course, classical histories, uh, the Chochung, the Yungjungbun Ten, Tenjung, the Tepder, Gyarap, you know, etc. So many. And other classical Tibetan texts where you can extract history from are Namtar, Sungbum, Karchuk, philosophical materials, mytho-ritual materials, genealogical, Lu, Gur, uh, Drung, uh, Chim, there are so many uh, potential sources for the study of Tibetan history, uh, which is really on a plateau-wide level still very much in its infancy. So I want to just give a couple examples on how text, a couple of very, you know, interesting, uh, quite famous uh, extracts, excerpts from texts that uh, speak about these early uh, proto-states. Uh, uh, particularly, we're going to look at uh, relationships between Shangshung and Pugyalpu, central Tibet. So, uh, Jigtengompo, probably written late 12th century, uh, you know, authored a very famous source, which was taken verbatim, word by word, uh, for uh, Tukwan's uh, Drupta, that's a uh, uh, work on religious religions, uh, Gelupa. So this is a very famous and important uh, textual reference. It goes back to the Drigungpa uh, in the 12th century. However, it was um, uh, taken, as I said, uh, uh, and, and borrowed uh, by the Gelupa for their uh, religious historical uh, uh, texts. So let's look at this textual uh, source now, Eight hundred, more than 800 years old. Uh, so it, it's speaking here about what they call Kyarbun. Kyarbun is a uh, form of burn mentioned in Buddhist textual sources. It is not uh, mentioned in Yungjungbun sources. So it, it roughly translates as outbreak burn or the burn that you know, spread uh, rapidly. And uh, it's, uh, in the text, it's characterized as follows. The Bonpo of Tibet did not know how to do the funeral ritual of King Drigun Sempo. 
Dragoon Sempo was the eighth king of the uh, Yarlung uh, dynasty of the, and uh, he was assassinated, and they this, this so we put that in context. So they needed funerary rites, but at least according to this text, they did not have them. They had to borrow them from uh, Shangsheng, as you will see. So three Bonpo were invited from Kashmir, Kachi, Adrusha, which is northern in northern Pakistan. Uh, it, it corresponds with the uh, the Dru region, Dru uh, region, and the uh, Bru region, and the uh, Bru Brushaski uh, language. Ed uh, Shansheng. So, you know, according to the source, they had to bring in priests from the far west to conduct a funeral because he died a violent death. It needed a special kind of funeral called Jishi. One of them, as a consequence of the worship of Gekko, Gekko, who is, according to Yung Jung Bun's sources, the chief of the Shang, was the chief of the Shangshun gods, uh, but also mentioned like in uh, Nyarang, uh, Nyarang uh, uh, Cho Chung, uh, 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 excuse me, uh, Nyang, uh, Nyang, uh, Nyang uh, Cho Chung, also dating back to, I believe, the 12th century. Or thereabouts. Uh, so they also mention Gekko. So Buddhist sources, other Buddhist sources, also mention that Gekko was a deity from the West. And Kyung, of course, which is a deity, uh, you know, the horned eagle, which is synonymous really with uh, Western Tibetan uh, lineages and, uh, you know, clans. And Mela, a god of fire for some reason, but that's mentioned in the text. And this, these priests could show that they, their power by flying on a drum, which is very interesting because we have the same kind of imagery even in um, North, uh, in, uh, in uh, Northern Asia, uh, shamans, for instance, riding drums, and could handle red, op uh, red hot objects, cut iron with a butter, uh, bird feather, and so forth. And they could do v various types of divination, including jutik and the uh, laka and also uh, Sokmar, which may be a kind of scapulumency. Uh, so one of them, uh, one of them knew the various components of the funerary rituals. Uh, now, I'm not sure which, which of the priests was the one, were they, were, were, was it the one from uh, Kashmir? Was it the Bonpo from Kashmir, Jusha or Shangsheng? I cannot say, but it's clear that in the early funerary rites preserved in the Dungwan manuscripts, Old Tibetan, and also in the Yungjungbun 11th century Mucho Chomdor, it's called, a collection of funerary texts, uh, that they had this kind of, they had these kind of, of funerary traditions known as uh, Jishi, and here the subjugation or the subdual of the uh, of, uh, agents of, of violent death uh, known as Jidulwa. So, very likely that these funerary rites came from Tibet or at least passed through, um, came from Shangshung or at least passed through. So interesting enough, we have this reference here, you know, tying together Shangshung with um, uh, Pugilpu, uh, really as two distinctive cultural entities in this uh, context. And then this, uh, I'll, I'll give you another example of a relationship. So according to the Tro, by Captain Rinchen Ozer uh, in the early period, it's before the seventh century, I think, shorthand for. Uh, the border between Shangsheng and Tibet was around Sangkara. And uh, according to Lopan Tenzin Namdak, who the foremost Yungjung Bone scholar now uh, 97 years of age uh, and still very sharp, a uh, very, very great man and scholar, uh, he has located the, uh, this uh, Shangshung um, a Kayuk, uh, excuse me, a Shangshung uh, a Sankarak, uh, Sankarak II, uh, around the region, around the mountain, a very famous mountain known as Sanglapudar, not far from Shangshung, uh, from Sangsang. Sangsang Labrak, of course, was a very important site of uh, uh, terma discoveries by both the Nyingma and the Yungjung Bun. Now, why I picked this reference is because this geographic pinpoint from the 14th century dovetails beautifully with the archaeological evidence, with the special kinds of 
I'm going to show you more in a few minutes, but I already showed a picture of those standing stones and at, at the uh, at a Shangshung necropolis of these very specific types of Doring mon monuments. And so the Doring monument, it, they're no located all over the region of Upper Tibet, and they extend all the way almost to Sanglapudar. So very interesting. I don't think it's a coincidence. Uh, the textual and archaeological evidence in this case converge. So this is just two examples from my work of so many possibilities of using texts for, um, for research on ancient Tibet, uh, for those who uh, uh, might be interested. And then I think we'll look at the archaeological evidence because I, th I, I think uh, this is important and we'll probably spend most of the remaining part of this talk on the archaeology. And this is a very simplified presentation on this slide. There are various types of monuments and material culture and how these are built and how they were manufactured and where they're located and what they were used for and what they say about the society and economy of ancient times can be used as markers, uh, cultural markers, of uh, the distinct regions of pre-7th century Tibet. Uh, so this is very interesting. We know, for instance, as I mentioned uh, briefly, the ancient monuments of Upper Tibet uh, are very different than those from Central Tibet, from Pugilpu, before uh, the time of, uh, the, of the imperial period, before the time of uh, Songtsen Gampo and the, em and the emperors, the Sempo. So very different kinds of monuments in Western Tibet and the Chengtung in early times. Material culture, same with ceramics. Ceramics are a real marker of cultural affiliation uh, all around the world. And we see very distinctly, for instance, that the ceramics of southeastern Tibet are very different than those from central Tibet, which also differ from those that have been discovered in central Tibet, say, from the first millennium BC. So they also can be used at, to understand, to delineate the early uh, cultural foundations of, of uh, the Tibetan Plateau. And of course, you know, as I mentioned before, you have all these other media, wood, stone, glass, etc., etc. Now the chronology, I think it's important that this talk, it's very important, I, I think I have to reiterate, this talk is focused on the late prehistoric era from circa 1200 uh, BCE to 600 CE. So we're speaking about pre the time before writing, the time before of the, the Tibetan Empire, the time before uh, Namli Lonsten and Songsten Gampo. So we're talking about early Tibet, prehistoric Tibet. And of course the historic era, in my work I divide the historic era as, as shown on this slide. And in, uh, I don't really talk about the Tempe Chidar or a, uh, or a, a uh, in that particularly, I talk about a vestigial period in the sense of early traditions surviving after the Tempe Chidar. All right, and then, uh, you know, and I call the post-1950 the modern period, in a, which it is in a cultural, uh, cultural sense. This is a timeline for Tibet. I don't think I'll go over much of that, but my point here would be that we can compare what was happening in Tibet with what was happening in other countries, civilizations all over the world. So you will see certain differences and also certain parallels between Tibet, Africa, Europe, the Middle East, of course, other parts of Asia and uh, South America. Uh, there are, you know, there in, the, in the human experience, uh, all around the globe, there are certain, if you will, uh, universal links uh, that uh, transcend, you know, the specificity of culture and uh, languages. Now, my expertise is um, Western Tibet, Upper Tibet, uh, in the uh, prehistoric, uh, late prehistoric period. So I won't talk too much more about the prehistory of Central Tibet, of Asha, uh, of Jiang, of Minyak, uh, in, 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 in Ladakh in this talk. But those are areas, those are areas that certainly uh, should be uh, researched, examined, explored 
much more than they have already so that a much more comprehensive picture of these early centers of civilization can be put together. So roughly according to the monuments, uh, the ancient monuments of Upper Tibet, Shangshung or what was known as Shangshung in the first half of the seventh century, according to Tibetan sources, and also mentioned in Tung and Sui uh, Tzu dynasty uh, annals, uh, Chinese, in the sixth, seventh century as Yang Tong. But to here we're, we're, we're focusing on uh, Tibetan traditions. Uh, but there were, um, uh, Shangsheng is again, it's an old ethnonym. In, in Tibetan sources, it goes far back. And, but how far back, we don't know because a lot of the monuments I will show you date to the first millennium BC and afterwards to the, the first half of the uh, first, uh, uh, first millennium uh, CE. But these, um, these monuments are very distinctive, as I said, very special, and they delineate a large geographic region which is underlined uh, on the slide, as you can see. So this is what we're going to talk about. And then I thought I, I would just, you know, briefly, these are the people of Upper Tibet. Uh, in the upper left side are people from uh, the village of Tang in a Guge in the Zarang region, uh, on the other side uh, of the border from Chitkul in Kongra, uh, in, in rather, in, in Chitkul in uh, Kinor, excuse me. Uh, you can also see a group of young monks and uh, youngsters there. That's from Tangra Yumso. Uh, in the central Chungtung. On the far right is a Yungjungbun Nakba, also from uh, Tungra Yumso. And then in the uh, bottom, then we see various other uh, people and professions uh, represented in Upper Tibet. Now, I don't think we have a lot of time, so I would, you know, if I was giving a longer talk or I was giving a class, I would talk about the methods, like how do you survey monuments? And how do you use text objectively? And how do you collect oral traditions, which are also a very important source? And how do you use them objectively, rationally, in, in understanding early history? But that would be, that's time, that's for another talk. But these are the kind of methods I use in my work. And these are the objectives of my work. I mean, ultimately what I want to understand is where, because I specifically work on Upper Tibet, but you could say all of Tibet, appraise where does Tibet fit in the larger map of Eurasia, right? What were its relationships with other people? And we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, near the end of the talk. Um, these are, this map, uh, these little dots show over 700 sites that I have surveyed uh, between 1993 and 2016 in Upper Tibet, Chengtung and De. And there are all kinds. There's uh, various kinds of uh, cal uh, castles, palaces, uh, and residences, temples, these kind of things here. And this is just to uh, give you a brief uh, outline of the kind of structures that existed there before the seventh century. Uh, this is an artist's rendition of an all stone corbelled structure. They were very different, these monumental castles and what may have been temples and palaces. They're all stone structures with tiny doors. Sometimes the doors are only 80 centimeters in height. They're often windowless, and they were often built partially underground. Very, very different architecture than what developed in central Tibet and what developed in Tibet all over after the 7th century. This is Gekko Karlungkar and Gekko Karlung. It's a very large early installation. I dated a piece of wood here to around the beginning of the Common Era, so around 2,000 years uh, old or so. And it, it's, it's at least one indicator. There's so much more work, as I mentioned, to be done specifically, you know, also on the archaeological front. But this gives us at least an idea of the antiquity of these structures. Here is uh, one of the structures at Gekko Karlunkar see a very small door, no windows, entirely built of stone. Uh, even the second floor doesn't have wooden rafters. It has stone corbels and stone 
stones between the corbels to create the floor and the roofs. No wood in these structures, entirely made of stone, very strong, very durable. Here's a, a subterranean structure, a gecko carlung, perhaps used for religious purposes. Uh, you know, unlike uh, the Buddhist era and uh, Tibet after the seventh century, uh, in early times the Tibetans were very comfortable with living underground or partially underground. Much warmer, of course, easy to heat. There are good reasons in Upper Tibet to want to live close to the earth because it has a very uh, difficult climate. Even in early times, the climate was not easy. And here's just a, as we survey here, just so, you know, we browse through some of these early uh, sites. Chukso Chokpo Zong in Tungur Yumso. And this entire uh, formation is covered in buildings uh, spread out over thousands of square meters. Here's a close-up of some of the all-stone corbelled structures. Here's one of the all-stone corbelled structures. These are very large buildings, some of them. However, the doors are very small. This, this door you can see in the front there is only about one meter in height. So you really had to duck down. You almost had to crawl to get in to these, uh, into these structures. Specifically how they were used. Uh, they must have been used for all kinds of purposes. But again, there's so much more investigation to be done on how, these early, how people lived in these early structures. And this is just an artist's rendition of an all a smaller all-stone corbelled hermitage or residential structure. This is one of the highest of these kind of all-stone corbel structures at Gyeongtuk. You know, th more than 300 meters higher than Gyeongtuk Gompa, a Jigun Kargyu installation in the center of the Mount Kailash uh, in the Nangkor, in the very heart of uh, uh, the Mount Kailash uh, sacred circuit. And, you know, and basically Gyangrak and uh, Rongbuk uh, at the foot of Mount Everest in, uh, uh, near Tingri are two of the highest, you know, permanent uh, facilities of any great size in Tibet. And they're, you know, and they're around uh, 5,100 meters or so. But this, this building I'm showing you here is at 5,400 meters. In historical times, only Repa and uh, Naljorpa, yogis, uh, could camp out, could bivouac at, you know, and meditate at such high level places. But in early times, Tibetan civilization was spread, at least in the West, at much higher elevations. Here's from the interior of one of the all-stone corbelled structures of Upper Tibet. This one is located on an island in Teddy Namso in the Chokchu region, what's now known as Sochin County. And you know, note, note the buttresses, the many wall buttresses, and uh, observe the roof. You can see the bridging stones, the roof, the, uh, roof sheathing, and uh, the corbels there. Well, this is give you an idea. This is fairly intact. Uh, version because it's located on what was an island. You have to walk uh, a number of kilometers on a very thin piece of gravel, a gravel spit, an isthmus, to reach this erstwhile island. And so this gives you an idea. It's a very different form of architecture. But of course, this is in a very rough condition. At one time, it would have been very neat, square. The walls would have been you know, plastered and perhaps painted, even with perhaps nice colors, the floor would have been beautifully plastered, maybe there was, in some cases, they were lined with stones. So, remember, you're looking at a ruin here. Uh, but it gives you some idea on how Tibetans in Upper Tibet, Chengtangte, lived, you know, uh, roughly uh, 2,000 years ago, even, um, even up to perhaps 1,000 years ago. Now we look at the ceremonial ritual and burial monuments. I particularly want to look at uh, these pillars, two types of pillar monuments that circumscribe uh, the Upper Tibetan region that at least, as I mentioned, since about 600 has been known as Shangshung. What it was known as in 500 BC or 700 BC, I can't say, but, it, but what I can say is that it has a distinctive array of archaeological monuments which circumscribe a very specific geographic region uh, found nowhere else in Tibet. So these are the walled-in long stones. There's 
a site like this, very close to Sangla Pudar, the sacred mountain, one of the Gurla Chupsum, uh, that is mentioned in the Tro text as the south eastern border of Shangshu. And this is located right near there. If you go further east, uh, these monuments do not exist at all. And so they exist all over Upper Tibet, but they stop near Sangla Pudar, just as is indicated was the border of Shangshu in the 14, in, 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 by, um, in the, in the Tro text by Kepdun in the 14th century. Here's another example, that's Kusi Doring, and you can see all of the uh, to, to, or Doring, on the west side there, and then the uh, walls, it's all now, you know, of course, heavily damaged. Generally, these monuments are aligned in the cardinal directions, so they, the stones are, the, the, the standing stones are found in the west. You can see the stones are heavily eroded. But I have uh, surveyed, and I don't know the number off the top of my head, but around 100 of these sites all over Upper Tibet. Now here's an artist version, uh, an artist uh, uh, conception of these longstone uh, necropolises. What a, we saw a picture earlier when I, when I showed pictures of monuments from the six centers of early Tibetan civilization. And uh, you know, they composed of thousands of, in some cases, standing stones, very large temple tombs, all, cor all corbelled stone structures, and also uh, uh, slab wall uh, networks and other and often outlying tombs of different kinds. And so this monument again very neatly circumscribes the Upper Tibetan region. They are not found in Ladakh, they are not found in uh, Central Tibet, Pugyalpu, they are not found anywhere else on the plateau, only on the Changtung and in De. And here's an actual example of a, one, Kangmart Zashak, uh, located on the border of um, Naksang and um, Girtse. And you can see the temple tomb in the background, very ruined. And the, some of the st standing stones, most of them have been uprooted and even carried away. So, you know, envision, uh, envision all of those stones in the front there, standing stones, Doring, as standing straight in rows, tightly, quite tightly packed. Here's a very spectacular example. One of the uh, one of the complexes at Yulkombu. You can see, in this case, there's about 800 uh, standing stones there, with a very large temple tomb in the background. Now I think we're getting fairly close to the end of the talk, so I just want to cover a few more points. You know, I, I can only do so much in one hour, but I just want to give you a little introduction to the vast subject of early t uh, civilization in Tibet. Uh, this mask, the golden mask, was found uh, excavated in Guge about 10 years ago, and it dates to, uh, I believe to date between about the 1st century BCE and 2nd uh, century CE. It had a shroud attached to it uh, uh, made of, of, of silk, so it must probably imported into Tibet and uh, used for this purpose. Uh, in the top band, you can see three what seem to be a Nawa, a, a blue sheep, uh, and also uh, birds and what appear to be trees. All of these figures are mentioned in the archaic funerary text of Dunhuan and also those of Gatang Bumpa, old, old Tibetan texts and also in the um, Mucho Tromdor, a, a, a collection of uh, early uh, ritual, funerary rituals that has been somewhat adapted to uh, modern uh, religious traditions. And you can also see three-step structures if you look carefully in the picture. Those look like chortons. They are not chortons. Uh, according to Jung Jung Bun sources, they're known as Sekar and Laten and Nangten. And they're still built in some places to this day, uh, something similar, but they're used often to enshrine local deities. But obviously they were very important in early times because they're found on the mask. They're also found in rock art. And so 
we might conclude from this, uh, as I do in my one of my uh, 2020 books on uh, the early um, steppe structures and inscriptions of Tibet, that these early structures uh, really had much uh, to do, they had much influence on the the way that Tibetan uh, uh, stupa architecture came came up in Tibet. And of course, uh, much earlier, uh, the great Tibetan scholar um, uh, Gende Chopel also came to this uh, realization and believed that the Tibetan Chorten was actually derived from earlier types of steppe structures on the Tibetan plateau. And he was absolutely correct in this case, as we can see here, the proof. On the right are actually, they're not Tibetan items. They're, they're from Pazirik, a uh, Skito-Siberian culture in uh, the Altai in Siberia. And they're, uh, they're housed in the, uh, the famous Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. But why I put this up is because t Tibetan texts, the Mucho Tomdor and the old Tibetan and Gatang Bumpa texts, talk about horses with horned headdresses, often bird horns, like the kyum, but other types of horned headdresses on top of, uh, used on top of the horses that ritually transported the body of the dead, the, the dead to, uh, or the spirit of the dead to the afterlife. So this is very different conceptions, very different material culture, very different religious system than that that came to Tibet with Buddhism. Although Buddhist funerary traditions in Tibet absorbed some early traditions, uh, they gained much of their philosophical orientation and praxis uh, from Buddhism, uh, not from the early traditions. So as I say, there are some early uh, traditions, pre-Buddhist traditions in the, in the uh, Buddhist uh, funerary texts. So it's another world. Ancient Tibet was a different world composed of various cultures and people, uh, but people that shared uh, their genetic patrimony in common. People that probably uh, very may have intermarried, people that certainly would have traded with each other, would have known about each other, and um, you know were part of the family, if you will, of Tibetan civilization. That what became uh, Tibetan civilization as we know it in the seventh century. Then f uh, uh, finally, I just want to mention briefly an, an, uh, a final important point. We should not see Tibetan, early Tibetan civilization as isolated. We think sometimes, you know, uh, particularly outsiders, Westerners, we think that, you know, of Lhasa perhaps as it was a forbidden city and that Tibet was closed and Tibetans didn't want much interaction, you know, with, uh, with foreigners in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, but, but clearly that was not the case in ancient times. Tibetans before the time of Songsten Gampo, and certainly even after, but we're looking particularly now at the early period, uh, were interacting, were trading, were maybe fighting with, were befriending, maybe uh, sending emissaries, diplomats, uh, religious missions to and fro all over Inner Asia and maybe even further abroad. Jung Jung Bern texts talk about this because they mention that Bern, uh, priests, actually resided in many, many different countries. And we might take that as an as an ally, uh, as a kind of metaphor uh, or shorthand for that a common body of traditions that spread all over Inner Asia and beyond, Tibet, and of course, you know, uh, Mongolia, uh, what's now a, a, a Western China, maybe what we could call the Northern Zone, uh, as I mentioned, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Northern Afghanistan, Northern Pakistan, uh, and so forth. And so Tibetans were not isolated. They knew about other people. Very, very clearly they did. So we see, for instance, this Eurasian animal style from the first millennium BC. We see that the Tibetans of Ngari and the Tibetans of uh, maybe uh, of Kekyu Do in uh, northeastern Tibet was uh, believed to be part of Sumpa, according to uh, Tibetan tradition. Uh, they had these kind of animals with these spirals and or double volutes uh, in the in ornamenting the body as did Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Siberia, uh, East Turkestan and um, um, Mongolia for that matter. 
So they shared, a, at the very least, they shared artistic traditions, but behind these artistic traditions were very likely concepts, ideologies, that motivated people all over a very va a vast area of, Euro of Asia. Really, the Eurasian animal, uh, animal style spread all the way to uh, Celtic Europe and Thrace in, in the West, and, on all, and, and likewise in the um, Western Zhao dynasty, the Chinese also adopted Eurasian animal style um, uh, uh, you know, icons and um, you know, seminal forms. And, 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 you know, so we have this, you could call this a cosmopolitan style, an international style of art with ideological underpinnings of which we know very little anymore about. Here's another example, and this is quite clearly proof that uh, Tibetans in uh, what we might call Shangsheng, Upper Tibet, knew about chariots. So again, I mean, if we think about later times in Tibet, the wheel was generally used to mill grain and for prayer wheels and, and those sorts of functions. They did not uh, have wheeled vehicles in Tibet uh, before the 20th century, historically speaking at least for the most part. Now, there may be some exceptions in the Far East. Um, but, however, in early times, second millennium, maybe as early as the second millennium BC, but certainly in the first millennium BC, the Tibetans knew chariots, wheeled, two-wheeled vehicles. And here in the picture, you can see one from the Western Changtang. That's from a, a site called Rigel. Uh, we can see uh, one from uh, below, uh, Tachu. Uh, that's from the region they now like to call Yushul, uh, also probably part of Sumpa at one time. There are such chariots also in Asha regions in the northeastern in Amdo, and we see them all over Inner Asia. Uh, and of course, uh, well, before we get to that, let's look at the one on the far right uh, from Guge. So even in Guge, they had these veal. This one, I think, is a little later. It may date back about uh, to the Iron Age, uh, 2,000 years or so multi-wheeled, quite different. You can see the charioteer, the man in the chariot there, or woman, probably a man, uh, with a horned headdress, it seems, three-pronged headdress. You can't, unfortunately, uh, you need a close-up picture, which I have, but I, I don't have that on the slide, but it looks as though he has a helmet or headdress with horns on it, and he's driving a chariot with two horses, and in front of the two horses of the Guge chariot is a groom or a, a tadzi, as it's called in Tibetan. It looks like someone that's restraining the horses. But these chariots of very similar type, uh, sometimes nearly identical, are found in Kazakhstan, in Kyrgyzstan, in Siberia, in Mongolia, in Ladakh, northern Pakistan, and in the northern zone of China, which was non-Han at that time, in places like Ningxia. And so here, again, was a powerful instrument, a powerful symbol of you know cosmopolitan interactivity in early times in the second first millennium BC, the Tibetans in ancient times were not isolated people. They were part, at least technologically speaking, and in some degree ideologically, they were part of a greater world. While they had their distinctive cult distinctive cultures, like other people had their distinct other peoples had, of course, distinctive cultures. They had certain things in common. So think nowadays a car. We have cars in. You know, uh, China, we have cars in India, we have cars in America, we have cars in Europe, but clearly they all belong to, uh, you know, very different cultures, but they all have automobiles. Well, likewise, 3,000 years ago in Tibet, uh, they at least knew of chariots, uh, if not actually built chariots. There's some, exam some evidence, actually archaeological evidence, for a cart or chariot in Amdo, in northeastern Tibet, uh, that's been found. Unfortunately, it was the study, the excavation was done by Chinese archaeologists and Unfortunately, the information on the subject is uh, on the site is very limited. Uh, if you're interested in that kind of uh, kind of topics, of course, uh, look at my books. Um, you can go to my website, Tibet uh, Tibet uh, um, Archaeology .com, and a list of all my books are there. And there's lots and lots of materials, archaeological, textual, and oral traditions. Oh, oh, so let's just brief. I think we have one or one more. Or we're best, we're just nearly done here. But again, mirrors to really, as I say, to understand ritual Tibet traditions in Tibet, you have to understand the melong, the ritual mirror. And you have to understand, for that matter, the deu, or the da, the arrow, the arrowhead. They're very, they were very important ritual instruments for, 
thousands of years in Tibet. And here's pictures. So on the left, excuse me, on the, yes, on the left. On the left, you can see here a copper alloy uh, 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 Meilong Tibetan. So if it's if a type found uh, in many places in Tibet, many of them unearthed, most of them have been sold off, like this one, and now I'm part of in a private collection. Uh, this Meilung predates the 7th century. And then on the right, you can see other Meilung, including uh, Tibetan uh, Meilung and also Meilung from Skito Siberian cultures of the first millennium BC. Ian, you can see they're not the same, but there are certain similarities. Again, we see that different peoples use similar technologies and pro under, underpinned probably by certain common ideologies in their ritual traditions. Fascinating, really. So Tibet was, ancient Tibet was a, a land that was uh, open to inputs from other parts of, of, uh, of uh, Inner Asia and Eurasia at large, but probably also certain things came from Tibet and, and, and went out, projected out to other areas of Asia. And that's, of course, a very interesting uh, subject of research that really very little has been done. How did, uh, what, what did the early Tibetans contribute to the world? That is, that's a big question that, that needs to be answered. And of course, this is a multi-generational project, but uh, hopefully answers will come someday. someday. Again here, finally, we see you know, to so-called Tokchas on the, on the far uh, left there and, then, uh, and on the top right. And then you see below on the right there the, the, uh, the drawings there of objects from the slab grave culture, which dates basically from around 1100 to 500 BCE. And so again, it looks as though Tibetans were borrowing certain design traits and there are uh, many examples of this in um, northeastern Tibet of them probably borrowing tradi metallurgical traditions uh, from Siberia and Mongolia in particular, but also East Turkestan. And it's probably, that's probably where bronze metallurgy entered the Tibetan plateau from the north, from East Turkestan, uh, or uh, the Central Asian Republics, or uh, alternatively um, Mongolia uh, and, and those, those areas to the north. So that's it. I want to thank you very much. This is just a picture of a bronze face in a pre-Buddhist and a red ochre face in pre-Buddhist here. So these, if you're Tibetan, these are kind of your ancestors. You might say I spent too much time on Upper Tibet and Shangshung, but you know, even if you're from Dokum, there are many oral traditions, say for instance in Amdo Muge, of people migrating from uh, uh, Shangshung to uh, Amdo Muge and also um, to Gamarong. All, many traditions in Gamarong of people coming from far west. And also uh, in, um, in um, Golok, there's a tradition of people coming perhaps during the imperial period uh, from uh, Ladakh. And so even if you're from Eastern Tibet, in some way you owe uh, some of your cultural and probably genetic patrimony, you know, ancestral patrimony to Western Tibet. Uh, you know, going back to the Iron Age and Late Bronze Age. Thank you very much for, your, uh, for listening to this talk. I very much appreciate it. Again, if you're interested in further in my work, um, please visit my website, uh, www tibetarchaeology.com or in my Facebook page Tibet Archaeology where I post uh, various things about ancient Tibet. Thank you again.